Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and in this episode, we bring the war to a close with Longstreet, with a description of his role at Appomattox, and shortly after the surrender. The Army of Northern Virginia marched along the roads leaving Richmond. As usual, Longstreet and Lee rode together most of the time, Lee always seeking the advice of Longstreet. When the Army first stopped for a rest and to eat, the two generals shared a meal with a family along the road. Their hosts talked confidently of victory still. Longstreet didn't respond to the comment, but Lee stated, Whatever happens, know this, that no men ever fought better than those who have stood by me. On April 4th, the army crossed the Appomattox River and made their way to Amelia Courthouse, expecting to find a cache of supplies, but they found none. Foraging parties then spread out along the countryside to gather any foodstuffs available. The foraging would cost the army a valuable day of movement. Grant was close at hand, marching by parallel routes toward the beleaguered Confederates. Longstreet deployed the divisions Charles Field and Cadmus Wilcox to protect the wagon train as the foraging continued. The lost day allowed for the Union Army to close in on Lee, blocking his route to Jetersville and forcing Longstreet's lead columns to march northward toward Farmville. The hard fighting Longstreet positioned his troops in line of battle at Rice's Station, awaiting the troops of Richard Ewell, who was to join them soon. Longstreet waited throughout April 6 with Lee impatiently awaiting word of Ewell's arrival. Word came that Ewell's command had been attacked at Sailor's Creek. Lee rode with William Mahone and his division to the side of battle, and overlooking the bluff could see Confederate troops streaming back. He commented to William Mahone, my God, has the army dissolved. Generals Ewell, Kershaw, and Custis Lee, Lee's son, was captured in the engagement. At about 10 p.m., Longstreet pulled his troops away from Rice's station and marched toward Farmville, recrossing the Appomattox River. A group of officers, led by Brigadier General William Pendleton, the Army's artillery commander, approached Longstreet about surrendering and wanted Longstreet to approach Lee with the idea, knowing he held the confidence of Lee. Longstreet responded that he was there to support Lee, not pull him down, and that he believed the men could still whoop four times their number, and as long as that was true, he would not propose surrender. As Longstreet and Lee rested near the lines, a courier approached with a letter from Grant, asking for the surrender of the army. It read in part, The results of the last week must convince you of the hopelessness of further resistance on the part of the Army of Northern Virginia in this struggle. After Lee read the letter, he handed it to Longstreet. Lee's old warhorse read the letter from his old friend and then handed it back to Lee and said, Not yet. Lee then wrote a letter back to Grant without conferring with anyone. In it, he dismissed Grant's assertion that the fight was hopeless, but did ask for terms. He showed the letter to no one, sealed it, then gave it to a courier. Longstreet remembered a moment on the retreat that illustrated the strain put on Lee. One evening after dark, as we rode, we stopped at a little fire that someone had started and left. While a number were hovering about it, General Lee standing near, leaning against a small tree passed off into slumber and seemed so rigid I had to look a second time to see if he had not passed into his last sleep. He was so troubled all of the march that he had little rest, I may say no rest, though nature demanded a little quiet. Longstreet and Lee again began their movement, this time toward Lynchburg. The army stopped just east of the community of Appomattox Courthouse along the Richmond-Lynchburg stage road. Lee hoped to gather supplies at Appomattox Station, but Federal cavalry under George Armstrong Custer seized the supply cars, and Federal infantry were forced marching to cut Lee and Longstreet off. It was April 8th, and Grant had sent another letter to Lee about a possible surrender. Lee agreed to meet with Grant at 10 o'clock the next morning. However, Lee thought it was only cavalry in his front, and that they may be able to break out, so he dispatched John B. Gordon and his corps to clear the way for the rest of the army. At dawn on April 9th, Gordon's corps attacked Federal cavalry, when the cavalry fell back, Union infantry took their place, sealing the fate of the Army of Northern Virginia. When Lee was informed of this, he stated, Then there is nothing left me but to go and see General Grant, and I would rather die a thousand deaths. Some accounts conflict on what happened next to Longstreet, but one account tells of Custer riding through Confederate lines with a flag of truce and was escorted to Longstreet. There, Custer stated, In the name of General Sheridan, I demand the unconditional surrender of this army. Longstreet glared at the young man, saying nothing and forcing Custer to repeat his words. When he did, Longstreet responded, I am not the commander of this army, and if I were, I would not surrender it to General Sheridan. 
Custer was then escorted out of Confederate lines. Longstreet then ordered Porter Alexander to prepare a battle line of Mahone and Wilcox's division to support Gordon. It would be the last battle line the Army of Northern Virginia formed. Alexander said that he remembered every detail of it. That morning, Longstreet met with other Confederate and some Union generals in the village of Appomattox Courthouse. Then, as he returned to Confederate lines, he met Lee in a small apple orchard. The two spoke for a few moments. Lee worried that Grant would demand harsh terms. Longstreet assured him that Grant would be fair, but as Lee started to leave, Longstreet told him, General, if he does not give us good terms, come back and let us fight it out. That would be Longstreet's last counsel with General Lee. Lee would surrender the Army of Northern Virginia to Grant at the home of Wilmer McLean. The troops would lay down their arms and then go home after being paroled. Once the surrender terms were signed, Lee rode back into Confederate lines where he was met with cheers from his soldiers who offered to keep on fighting when he informed them that they had been surrendered. Longstreet, Gordon, and Pendleton rode into Appomattox Courthouse as the commissioners appointed by Lee. As they rode to the McLean house, Grant spotted Longstreet. After he dismounted, Grant walked up to his old friend, grabbed him by the hands, and then embraced him. The Union commander offered Lee's old war horse a cigar, and then jokingly said, Pete, let us have another game of brag to recall the old days which were so pleasant to us all. After visiting for only a short time, Grant departed, and Longstreet helped prepare the troops and paroles. On the night of April 11th to the morning of the 12th, Lee and Longstreet shared their last campsite together. On the 12th, Lee would leave for Richmond. But that morning, the generals met at Lee's headquarters to say their final farewells. Lee warmly embraced Longstreet and told him goodbye, then turned to Tom Gorey, who stood next to Longstreet, and said, Captain, I'm going to put my old war horse under your charge. I want you to take good care of him. Lee rode off, never to see his old war horse again. Longstreet would depart later that day. He left with the thought that he may settle in Texas and start his new life there as a civilian, something he had not been in 27 years.